Hi everyone, and welcome to my channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tiana Bui, and welcome to another video where I'll be breaking down the different sustainability technical skills that I've come to learn in the corporate and consulting world. And so I hope you guys do find this useful. I definitely know when I was in school, I totally did not know about any of these things. And so really do hope that it's somewhat useful. With every skill that I present, I will have some sort of resource link there for you to learn more about it on your own time. And again, Again, this is more of just a high level view of everything and so if you want to learn more please I inquire you to go and use the free guidances and resources out there to help you learn a little bit more of how to actually do the technical skill. Before we start the video, I just wanted to take some time to tell you about this Julie brand, Anna Luisa. And in this video, I am wearing two of their pieces, Paris and Heritage. And I'm really fond of it because it really just adds that subtle yet extra pop to whatever it is that I'm wearing that day. I was impressed with this brand because unlike similar brands out there that just talk the talk when it comes to sustainability, preaching it all over the web pages. Ana Luisa actually has an impact report out there. So you can see in the report, they do mention three key areas as it relates to the environment. So they share information about their carbon footprint, their water impacts, and how it is that they're designing their products to be more circular. And so if you're not quite sure what being circular means, it really just means being able to give the raw materials and materials that's being used in the products another life. So either that, you know, being repaired or maybe having a recycling program out there so it can be reused in the jewelry that they have or maybe can be a material for another business out there that might be able to use it. They're also carbon neutral certified, which means that they've had their carbon emissions reviewed and offset by a verification company. And they also work with external partners for guidance on how to reduce the environmental impacts, which I have to say is a really important thing because a lot of businesses, they don't really have a sustainability team. And so if they're just trying to figure out by themselves, like it's not gonna work out. They really do sometimes have to outsource, especially if they don't have all the resources out there. But overall, I'm excited to see how they progress in the future. And if you are interested in trying out a piece for them, I've added a link in the description for you to check out after this video. <laughs> So the different skills that I wanted to share with you guys today is one, all about reporting disclosures. The second one will be about reporting frameworks and the last one will be all about assessments. So reporting disclosures are pretty much surveys and questionnaires that companies go online and answer and fill out. And this information is about their sustainability impacts, their governance, how their strategies are going to reduce their impacts and all that good stuff. And at the end of it, they do receive a score. So then investors, customers, and their stakeholders can understand how they're doing amongst their peers in this industry, but then also just overall what it is that they're going to do about it. The two big disclosure reporting systems out there is one CDP and the second one is called Ecovatus. Those are pretty much the ones that I've been exposed to in consulting. I'm not sure if there are any more, but definitely those two are really the big ones. So CDP is one of the ones that I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys will first get exposed to when starting out your consulting role or your corporate sustainability job. But basically it's this huge reporting system about 14,000 organization responded to CDP in 2021. And so you, you know that a lot of people are using it. So it might be one to jump on, but it's interesting because this one has three different types of questionnaires that a company can respond to. One of them is all about climate change. The second one is about water assessment. And the last one is about forest impacts. And so this one, as well as the other one, they're very lengthy, I'm not gonna lie. There is a huge learning curve to learning all these technical skills, to be honest. But the best part is that they have the guidance available out there, meaning they have all the questions that they ask a company right at your fingertips, free to access, and they also have the scoring methodologies in which you can you know, take that scoring sheet and see how companies are doing and maybe if you wanted to, taking a company's report and doing an exercise with yourself to see what types of scores that they got. So Ecovatus, to date, about 90,000 companies sit in their database where investors and people can go ahead 
and look at what they've got and this ranges from 175 countries and then also 200 industries. What makes this disclosure system really unique is that unlike CDP, EcoVadis focuses mainly on the environmental management within a company but then also needs to back every answer up with documentation and evidence. When talking to a couple of coworkers, it did mention that when completing EgoVadis, it is a very lengthy process because you are reading through a lot of documents to find that evidence that you need. So when you're helping these companies complete this, you're not only trying to type in the answer, but you're also looking through all their policies, regulations, their documents that could be hundreds of pages just to find that answer to make sure that it's evidenced. So like CDP, EcoVadis' guidances and resources are free online for you to access and I think it's really interesting because when I started learning all of this, even though it was such a learning curve and I literally was falling asleep all the time because I'm just reading so much, I'm honestly not the biggest reader in the world but it's it's what gets you learning. But anyways, it was interesting because I got to learn what different companies were doing in terms of their management for environmental stuff um, and what it is that they're doing to strategize against it and how they're engaging with other people to try to reach their goals. So it's overall a really great learning experience and how a business is overall figuring this out. So reporting frameworks. This one definitely varies from the disclosure reporting because disclosure reporting is kind of like going online, taking a quiz and filling out all the answers to get a score. And what frameworks are, are that they have a guidance of how to write a report. So think about when you were in elementary school and in order to write a proper essay, you needed to have an intro, um, three paragraphs of supporting details, and then the conclusion. It's kind of similar to that where these frameworks have guidances in terms of what needs to go in a company's sustainability report. And so the most common ones I've seen with this one is GRI, SASB, and TCFD, which is the one that's a little bit newer on the end. So the GRI stands for the Global Reporting Initiative, and in 2020, about 52% of Russell 1000 companies had GRI framework in their sustainability report. And if you're unfamiliar with the Russell 1000, it's okay, I'm a little bit unfamiliar with it as well, but all I know is that it has to do something with the stock market, and this represents basically more than 90% of all the stocks in the US market. And I guess I just bring that up because since it does represent a huge percentage of the US market, understanding that more than 50% of these companies came out with sustainability reports that had the GRI in there, it must mean that this is only gonna be a more popular framework as we keep going. Maybe it might hit 100 one day, but probably the number one that I'd associate myself with when trying to learn about frameworks. So the GRI standards, they do have different frameworks out there. They do have one called the universal standard where pretty much any company could go ahead and look at it and incorporate that specific information in their sustainability reports. But then they also do have some sector specific ones that cater to your own sector. So you might be wanting to use those if you do want to mention those specific impacts that are related to your company. So SASB, which also stands for the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, is really interesting because in 2020, out of the Russell 1000 companies, about 39% of them did have the SASB framework presented in their reports. But this is an interesting framework because it really does allow people to understand how a company identifies, manages, and communicates financially material sustainability information to an investors and so a lot of that is more for the investor space. SASB does have standard frameworks out there for about 77 different industries within 11 different sectors. So you can go on their website, find out which type of company, for example, is in the certain industry and sector, and based on that, can go ahead and review what it is and which type of information is needed in the sustainability report that follows SASB. So TCFD means the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Yes, it's a huge mouthful, but this work is really interesting because 
It's really all about trying to understand a company as it's getting impacted by climate change and what the heck they're gonna do to mitigate and what they strategize to do against climate change. And this is honestly a very huge booming area of framework reporting. I know the statistic that I'm gonna give you in 2020, about 19-ish percent of the Russell 1000 companies did use this framework in the reports. And honestly, this number is probably already gone up in 2021. This new report just didn't come out yet for the 2021 data, so sorry for the lack of data. But it's interesting because, you know, investors, they totally want to know what the heck is going to happen to their assets if this certain scenario of climate change is going to happen. And so I personally haven't worked on it, but do know some of my colleagues who've had more in-depth time with this area trying to take all these climate scenarios and trying to figure out the financial damages that would happen to these companies. And I, I totally know this work is just going to be increasing in the future and so if you do have the chance go ahead take a look at their website to familiarize yourself more about what this is all about these resources are out there for you guys to use and unfortunately if you're not in the industry right now it's kind of hard to learn it if you're not doing it but the good news is that if you do want to learn how to do it all you have to do is download a company like a big company's sustainability report and if you do search find and you put GRI, for example, you can see what type of information that they're putting into that sustainability report and you can cross-reference that with the actual framework that you can go ahead and download yourself on the GRI, GRI website. And so I know it's tough when you're trying to learn everything by yourself, but the good news is that there's a way, there's a will, there's a way. All right, so we've hit the arena of assessments and if you, didn't quite know what that is by now. It's pretty much assessing the environmental impacts of a company. And so the ones I'm familiar with and have been exposed to is one, all about greenhouse gases. The second one, water impacts and assessment. And the last one is a materiality assessment, which I'll get into in just a bit. Greenhouse gas accounting. If you haven't seen my other videos, this is the one that I talk about all the time because I was doing so much of this work in consulting and Pretty much this is about quantifying a company's greenhouse gas emissions by collecting data in the company, talking to different departments, gathering that, using this calculation method called the US Greenhouse Gas Protocol. That's, that's one of the main common ones that's used here in the US. And figuring out how much emissions is coming from a company. And through this process, you'll learn about the different scopes in carbon emissions. There's scope one, which is all about companies direct carbon emissions. The second one is about the electricity that they're consuming. And then the third one is all about everything coming upstream and then downstream from the company um, in terms of emissions. And so in their greenhouse gas protocol, again, Heck yeah, but everything's publicly available. But you can read about the different types of emissions, the calculation method, and I'm so sorry, it is a huge, dense piece of um, art, <laughs> I guess you can say. And there is definitely need to be some new version that comes out at some point, because the last one, be almost 10 years old, but it is a working area and a starting point at least for companies to understand everything regarding um, their carbon impacts. So the second type of assessment is called the water risk assessment. And I personally haven't had so much time with this, but do know that it's about understanding how a company consumes water, where is it consumed, how is it discharged, where is it discharged, and all that good information. And the tool that I do know that some companies use is called the WRI Aqueduct tool. And this is publicly available. It talks about more of how it's calculated, what the methodologies are, something that you guys can take the time to learn yourselves um, and what's interesting is that there are other water tools out there that are used to calculate water risk and what's interesting that I've been told in this area of work is that no one tool should be used alone to calculate the water risk of a company every tool has its own strength in terms of the calculations and so it would be the person's job to understand which tools are best at quantifying which um, variable and putting all of those pieces the strength pieces together to 
create the one and all water support. And sorry, it's a little vague, but hope that gives some understanding and some starting point to start that journey if that's where you feel like you should go. So last but not least, we have the materiality assessment. And what this is, is for a company to understand what's material or what's most important to a company in terms of their environmental impacts that they choose to focus on in the company. And so this is really important, especially when a company is newer on their environmental journey because there's always that huge question mark about like, what the heck are we supposed to focus on? There's so many things to focus on. Which ones do we do now and first? And so, in order to figure out this question, a materiality assessment is done by someone within the company or a consultant would help with this or conduct it for the company. And what happens is that first a questionnaire and a survey is made and an interview question list is made because what will happen is that this person would go ahead and interview the important stakeholders within the company. And then through that interview, figuring out what it is that they find to be of high importance. And so using the stakeholder interviews, understanding what it is that they care about, then using those results together, you can come out typically with this matrix about like what it is that's important to a company. So I hope you guys learned a thing or two about the different technical skills in this corporate sustainability space. And we'll put a recap slide here just so you guys can refresh your memory just a little bit. So yeah, until next time guys, bye.